Uh, but for now, we'll, we'll make a start. And um, so, I'd just like to say thanks very much for, excuse me, for coming along this evening, and hopefully, uh, this chat this tonight will be uh, informative and a little bit of lighthearted entertainment as well for you, just to learn from, um, from some mistakes that I've made along the way in my kind of uh, mountaineering journey. Uh, and that's what tonight's going to be about, just kind of one particular day out in the hills um, and just kind of covering kind of what I did, maybe what, what went wrong and kind of the decisions I made along the way. Hopefully that you can kind of learn from or kind of uh, relate to uh, as well. So we'll make a start and um, sorry, the computer's a bit slow sometimes here to move on. There we go. So uh, it, like last week's talk, uh, again, Cotswolds are supporting this one and they've been very kind and offered some great prizes to, to give away to you. Um, all you have to do is just be here, watch the talk, uh, answer a question at the end, uh, and you can be put into a lucky dip prize draw for some great quality prizes. And those prizes are a really good quality compass, a head torch, first aid kit, and a really, really good quality uh, rucksack as well. So stay tuned and you'll get your chance to uh, answer that question and, and potentially win a prize. Um, so uh, thanks very much to Coswold for that. So maybe you were here uh, last week and listening to last week's chat, but if, you're, if you've come along just to this one, um, I'm just going to ask a question to everyone again this evening and just ask where are you watching from this evening you know so my, my colleague who's working away in the background there is going to put up a question um, and if you just pick wherever you're watching from So most people are Scotland based, but there's a few down in, in England and Wales. So hello to you folk down there and just hello to everyone. So that's great, thank you. So regardless of where you are watching, you know, wherever your kind of your local hills are, wherever you like to go in the mountains, hopefully this information is useful no matter where you go in the hills. And again, just another question, uh, what, what activities do you do? Like, you know, when you go out and have your adventures, what, what's your kind of your main thing that you like to do the most? So there's another question going to pop up shortly. <laughs> I like the fact that if some people did hit the haggis hunting there, I, th I was hoping some folk would. But I can say the majority of folk are hill walkers, but there's a few people who like to do the, the mountain biking and, and running and wild swimming. So again, all the information tonight, it's relatable to whatever activity that you decide to go and do. So just kind of carrying on from, from last week's talk, and if you weren't here for, for the one last week, uh, again, it was recorded and you can follow it along on uh, YouTube. But just to kind of um, do a bit of a recap and just to kind of bring people up to speed who weren't here, that we're kind of following and using this Be Avalanche Aware process as a bit of a checklist to run through to kind of give ourselves uh, the ability to think logically and how to plan an effective day in the mountains. Um, but we're taking away that avalanche aspect um, and putting in just in general the weather and we're calling it be adventure aware, be adventure aware. So all that, all the planning, all the things that we do uh, using this checklist, um, we can apply to the summer and apply to any activity that we want to go and do uh, out in the mountains. So it's a really useful uh, starting point in your planning and, you know, going out into the mountains. 
um, using on a, on a regular basis. So yeah, last week very much touching on the, the planning stage. Um, so tonight's talk, we're going to be kind of focusing on these two things, the physical journey that we, we go out and do, and then key places, basically where that basically means anywhere that you need to make a decision or think about what's happening next in your, in your journey or in your day. And that can be any number of factors that can influence those decisions. So kind of, again, touching on from last week, this idea of decision making, you know, for us to have a good day out in the mountains, you know, the decisions that we make want to be consistently good, consistently positive to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And then that we're kind of helping ourselves to reduce any possible errors that might kind of creep in that could potentially lead us into difficult terrain that we don't want to be in or a decision that was not a good one that potentially has a negative outcome. Um, so again, it's just kind of this idea of consistently good decisions helps us to have better days out in the mountain. But this kind of talk tonight is going to look at kind of the decisions that I made on the journey that I did with my wife a number of years ago and how some of those decisions were good decisions and how some of them were actually not so good that then you know, led us into terrain that probably wasn't the best at the time, but we'll talk about that later on as we get into the talk. So we'll first look at this aspect, you know, the journey that we do out in the mountains. So we're going to kind of look at these three elements of the weather, us as the individuals and what experience we carry and what's our baggage that we take with us, you know, um, out into the hills and then the landscape that we're actually out in. So looking at this first aspect, kind of the experience party. Um, so this is myself and my wife, Tara, and our wee dog, Brea. Um, and some of the questions we're going to kind of look at as the experience party and in the area that we decided to go to, you know, is can we navigate? You know, do we have that skill set to use app and compass and phone or GPS to, as a navigational package to help us feel comfortable and safe in the environment that we're in. And then, you know, what, what equipment have we got with us? Is it appropriate for the terrain? Is it appropriate for the weather? You know, um, is it appropriate for us to use and do we know how to use it effectively? And do we have the experience to be in the mountains? You know, are we going out somewhere that is super remote and it's our first Munro? Or have we done, you know, years of hill walking and we're happy enough to be somewhere that is quite remote? Or challenging <clears throat> and are we fit and capable do we have that mountain fitness to be out there for a long period of time and feel happy that we can you know spend a lot of time on our feet uh, in the terrain and also have we told someone where we're going you know so um if i was to think about kind of some of the poor decisions that i made for this day that's the first decision that's kind of crept up that didn't happen. I didn't really tell anyone where we're going. Me and my wife just headed out on this journey, but we actually didn't tell anyone. So in terms of thinking about consistently good decisions, that was a decision that maybe wasn't a good one straight away, that we didn't leave a little bit of information with a friend just to say, hey, look, this is where we're going. So yeah, that was a little mistake on my part there. And it's something I think we need to sort of be more encouraged to do is just leave a little bit of information with a friend or someone to let you know where you're going and when you'll be back off the hills. So looking at the actual day that we wanted to go out and do, um, you know, we're slowly ticking off our Munro's and we thought, well, let's go have a day out up north, uh, up near Ullapool and go tick off these three Munro's, Ben Jerig, um, forgive my uh, pronunciation, Conmeal and Amphiokagak. Um, um, so we thought, oh, could we, we could do these three easily. And this is the journey that we had, well, I had planned for us to do. Um, so kind of get to the road, park up the road and, and make our way in through this terrain here. I didn't spend much time looking at the map. I just had a quick look going, yeah, it looks like it's manageable. Um, yeah, this looks like a good route. Um, and I thought, yeah, we, we, we can do this. So that, that was the, the plan for the day. And that's where we kind of decided to go and do. So in terms of our experience, in terms of, you know, 
uh, are we do we have the experience and skill set to actually go and do this route you know for for me i've been working in the hills i've been mountaineering and climbing for for almost 20 years you know i've got a lot of mountaineering qualifications that sort of help back that experience up but that's not to say that i'm i know everything i'm i'm certainly not you know, uh, at the top of the, the ladder in terms of knowing everything. As you'll find out in this talk that, you know, there's lots of little decisions that were made that were not the great ones, you know, so that is not a good reflection on my experience, but it helps develop experience, making those decisions. Uh, Brea, our, our dog, she's got about 120 Munros under her paws, so she's more than fucking capable for, for being out in the hills there as well. Um, and she'll do what she's told, you know, if she wants, if she wants, needs, needs to go, she'll go. That's the same for Tara as well. Um, only joking. So she's got about 120 Munros as well. So she's got a good amount of experience to be out in the, the hills in that environment as well. So we're, we're pretty capable, pretty fit, pretty experienced. So therefore we're kind of feeling happy to do this journey based on all of that. So we thought, right, well, it's a big day. Maybe we want to pack a little bit of a lighter bag. We don't want to carry too much excess stuff because we want to move fairly quickly and try and cover this ground. So our bags were fairly lightweight, um, packed with the absolute essentials we needed for that day. You know, so we didn't want to be burdened down by by too much. And in terms of our navigational toolbox, you know, we had map and compass ready to go in a waterproof case uh, somewhere that was easily accessible um, in a pocket somewhere and be able to navigate with and we also had you know our our smartphone with mapping software on it just as an addition to to all that you know and that as a as a navigational kind of toolbox is a really good toolbox to have because we can dip in and out of both or use one more than the other and then have the other ones back up depending on what we decide to use more often that day you know so this is the additional kind of phone that we had you know with the kind of the, the mapping software on it so we could navigate a little bit quicker with the phone and we could just kind of get it out and go all right that's where we are we can put that back onto the map and then carry on our journey and something to think about, you know, in addition to that, because your phone's your lifeline as well. If you're if you're driving up the road two hours to get to where you want to go and you're listening to music or Spotify, you're draining your battery and then you get into the hill and you've maybe only got 50% battery left, you know, and then you're using that constantly to track a route or do whatever, you know, uh, you'll drain the battery. So maybe having a wee kind of power bank with you and keeping it in a waterproof dry bag or a cheap alternative is a, a clear plastic bag to keep it waterproof and um, keep it safe as well when you're out there. Whilst we're on the subject of phones here, I've got a couple of other questions that we're just going to bring up, but it's also, there's two parts to this. Um, it's just to kind of get your uh, view on phones, but it's also to gather a little bit of research and information into um, how people are navigating in the mountains. So it's something that I'm kind of looking at more so and um, so there's a few questions uh, that will pop up if you want to kind of answer them that would be great and um, they'll pop up shortly <clears throat> okay that's great folks thanks very much for for answering that one and then there's a qu another question is going to immediately come up after this one as well so if you can answer that one that'd be great You know, I think technology, it's uh, its one of these things now that we just can't get away from. 
you know, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a great asset to be using for navigating with as an addition to Map and Compass, because it's quicker, it's easy, um, and it, it just helps as well, you know, so I think it's a, it's a useful addition to our ability to navigate safely in the mountains as long as we've got good battery in the phone. That's great, folks. Thanks very much for taking the time to answer those questions. I really appreciate that. And that helps me a lot in gathering kind of this information and data that I'm kind of starting to research a bit more in uh, the popularity of phones and GPS devices in in hill walking and in, in nowadays. So that's great. No, thank you very much for that. Appreciate that. Anyway, so moving on, moving on with uh, this day out that me and Tara had. So that's kind of looking at our our skills that we had, the experience that we've got, being ready and prepared for the journey that we're doing. And now we're looking at kind of the weather forecast that we had for that particular day. And I was lucky enough to um, actually grab this forecast of the day that we did, I think it was back in 2019. So um, just to kind of bring out some of the key bits of information that we were expecting to have that day, that it was becoming less windy throughout the day. So it was somewhat of an improving forecast patchy rain and showers, so it wasn't planning to be a particularly bad day by the signs of it. Clouds clearing into the afternoon, so maybe then thinking, oh, visibility will be good, we'll get to see some tops, and maybe then in terms of our navigation, we won't have to concentrate too much on navigation because we'll be able to see more. And then sunshine coming out, so oh, nice, nice dry day. So that was the forecast that we were expecting to have but it maybe didn't quite pan out like that for us on this day. Um, and you'll find out shortly. So I guess that just highlights the point that a forecast is a forecast. It's not a statement. You always have to take it with a pinch of salt and be prepared for maybe what if, you know, what if it's not going to be like that? So a good thing to do is maybe look ahead, look at the tomorrow's forecast and see if there's anything else that's developing and might come in and catch you out sooner. Rather than just looking at the day, look at that sort of 24 hours in advance as well. So you're kind of prepared for, for the unexpected. So this was us starting off our journey. That was our first Monroe way off in the distance, Ben Jerig there. So um, <clears throat> walking in, you can see uh, no waterproofs on. It's a bit cloudy in the distance, fairly bright. It looks fairly dry, you know, so just to kind of highlight where we are currently on the map on this Part of the day, just where the red arrow is, we're just beside that lock. So we're still fairly close um, to the road. However, the time that we started was quite late in the day. We, we decided to have a leisurely start and drive up. Um, and we actually started our day out quite late on. So maybe that's another little kind of poor decision on my part um, that led to our decisions later on in the day. So just bear that in mind, that it's a slightly later start for a big day out in the hills. So as we're progressing on the day, you know, we're kind of getting through some rough terrain that really wasn't quite, you know, obvious in terms of where a path went. You know, the red line and the map on the left shows kind of our intended route up on the hill. And we got to this point by 12.30, so progress was a little bit slower uh, than expected over this terrain. So again, that's starting to kind of get us to think about our day ahead and whether or not, you know, we're, we're in a position of actually doing this day. But we trudged on, we pushed forwards. So uh, here's a little bit of a, uh, a quiz challenge for you. Um, how's, your, how's your Gaelic? So there's a question that's going to come up, and the name um, Bjoga Gak, <laughs> forgive my pronunciation. Um, if you want to have a guess as to what that is in uh, in English, what that translation is.
Great, well done. So, if you had said, oh, if you'd said the heathery place, you'd have been right. So, well done. Um, so, again, one of those little poor decisions that I made on this day is maybe not using uh, the useful web resource of Warp Highlands to think about this day. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have used it. And if you look, you know, there's the blogs that people write up their days and their experiences of particular places that they go to. If I had spent that little bit of extra time in my planning for this day, I would have realized that some folk had mentioned in their blogs, this place being very wet and also having a very uneventful trudge in these Munros, which maybe kind of would get you to think twice about uh, going the way that we did for this day and maybe particular, maybe picking a, a nice dry day to go into this place because as the name suggests that one of the other Munros on the other side is a very heathery place so that kind of gets you to think about whether or not it's an appropriate uh, appropriate way we went so again going back to the planning Walk Islands is a very useful resource to get more information for your for your day out in the hills and again, that was my one of my errors that I didn't spend that time actually doing. So you can see here this picture paints a thousand words, really. So uh, this is us on the summit of Ben Jerig, the first Munro. Uh, <clears throat> and you can clearly see that, you know, full waterproofs, you know, is quite heavy rain. Visibility is very limited. Um, and Tara is doing her best to look happy, but is actually really quite um, put out, <laughs> to say the least. And we're here at half two, so um, that was a very long day uh, and long trudge just to get up to the first Munro with the intentions of doing three. So this is a place where we had a decision to make and we used as a key place. Um, and we'll look at what that is momentarily. But just kind of going back to the weather forecast, you know, it was suggesting patchy drizzly rain then isolated showers developing later and then extensive morning and breaks developing, but that never materialized. You know, we were expecting by the time we got up there for that weather to have improved, but it didn't. And as that picture clearly shows, you know, it was quite heavy rain and there was still a lot of cloud, you know, the cloud base was quite low. So, um, that also added into us making different decisions about what we were going to do for the rest of the day. So you can see there uh, in that little video, <clears throat> enthusiasm is lacking massively. Um, so we decided to have a chat and make this a key place to think, well, what are our options in terms of going down? We made the decision not to carry on to do the other two Munros, but it was the decision of how do we get down? What do we do that is the best course of action to get back down to safety? So looking at this next stage in the decision-making process is kind of the key places, you know, like I said, anywhere a decision needs to be made and that can be based on the weather. You is the, the person that's out for the day with the skills that you have or the group that you're with and the experiences that you have and then the landscape that you're in, you know, do any three of these things influence your decisions and what you do and where you make those decisions. So, Certainly the summit of Ben Jerick is where we made that decision to turn around. So yeah, you can see in this picture here, this map of Ben Jerick, you know, we, we made the decision at this point and we have options available to us. So this red route <clears throat> is the route that I thought, well, I'll have a quick look at the map, 
let's do this, let's get down and follow this red route back down to where we kind of basically started from. So that's the decision that I made, not really kind of consulting Tara too much. I thought, you know, let, let's just go, let's just get off the hill here. But, you know, the, the thing that we need to be a little bit careful about is on closer inspection, if you look at Ben Jerig, there's quite a few places where you could easily sort of disappear off the wrong direction if you're not careful. Um, especially with the weather that we had, you know, visibility was quite poor. So we needed to be careful about the slope direction. And this is kind of a key element in navigating in the mountains and poor visibility. And slope direction is really useful um, in knowing what direction you're actually going off the hill. Because, you know, sometimes we get to the summit of a Munro or the summit of a Corbett, you know, and we kind of like are like, yes, well done. We've got kind of, we've got the summit bag, summit fever. And then all of a sudden your brain just disengages and you kind of switch off. You think, right, it's home time. I'll just, I'll just head down the hill. But you may have stopped at the summit to get out, grab a sandwich or, or do whatever. And then maybe the visibility turns bad. You get a little bit disorientated and then you actually head off down the hill the wrong way. And I think, you know, at those moments, whenever you've switched off your brain, that's when things can start to go wrong for you. So we had that little bit of extra thinking time at the summit just to make sure that we weren't going off the wrong ridge or the wrong direction. So having the, the map set and orientated so we know which way north was using our compass, we could then, through a process of elimination, figure out that all these other slopes we could cancel out and we could pick the green line, which is the slope that we wanted to go down, which is the right way. So spending that little bit of extra time making that decision is the one that we, we needed to have there. And it's always a good idea, like a good carpenter is measured twice and cut once, just double check and make sure that you're actually doing the right thing. You know, give yourself that little bit of extra thinking time. But just in closer inspection, just having a look at that route, you know, we need to make sure we got that right because, you know, looking at this 3D image of the summit of Ben Jerig, the green line is the safe route off. But if we deviated off on our bearing or deviated off ever so slightly, those two red lines would take us over steep ground, which we didn't want to get into, you know, and that's where, you know, being a little bit careful with the poor visibility is going to help you um, not sort of deviate off kind of the route that you're choosing to go down. And maybe this is another kind of poor decision that I had made about going down this direction anyway, because there's a lot more challenge to that rather than uh, alternatives. And one of those challenges is if you look very carefully on a on an OS map that whenever you have missing contours anywhere where these index contours get squished together and other contours disappear. As a general rule of thumb, that indicates a 30 degree slope. And you might ask yourself, well, why is knowing what a 30 degree slope relevant to me? And if you look at kind of accidents and statistics of slips, trips, and falls at the mountains, most of the time, those accidents happen at the end of the day when people are tired, their brains are switched off, and maybe they have then either got themselves into terrain where there is missing contours and it's a 30 degree slope, or you're traveling down through terrain where it is 30 degrees and you do have that wee slip, trip or fall. And that's where most accidents in the mountains generally occur. So having a little bit of knowledge of what that looks like, you know, if there's missing contours, you can then start to think, oh, that, that's steep enough to potentially slip and have a wee tumble. So I just need to take my time and be careful about navigating through that environment and that terrain. <laughs> if you ever used Harvey's maps, um, they're quite useful in that they maybe, maybe don't have the missing contours because the contour intervaling is more than 10 meters, it's 15. But if you look very carefully, they would then color in contours to be slightly gray which indicates kind of rocky ground, but it's also indicating steep ground that's probably encroaching into that 30 degree environment. So again, that's another clue for you to then think about whether or not that terrain is, is steep enough to have we slip. But if you are traveling through that ground, 
just be careful about how you do it because you've got that knowledge to know that it's steep enough. So yeah, kind of thinking about that aspect, you know, it's like risk and consequence. You know, what are the risks of going down through that terrain and what are the consequences? You know, is your skill and experience and knowledge of that terrain, you know, have you got the, the risk tolerance to put yourself in that environment and cope and manage? You know, and for Tara and I, we felt happy enough that we had the skill set, the experience to be in that environment and be in terrain where it was steep. But the problem with the route that I chose off Ben Jerry to get us back down off the hill, yeah, it was a, it was a safe route because um, it was getting us back down. We we're following a linear feature of a, of a river source. Even though the visibility was really poor, I was like, well, if I follow this river downhill, I know it's going downhill. That's taking us back to where we want to be. So that is all the navigating that I had to do was just follow a stream downhill rather than having to pay too much attention in the map and compass or in the phone. I could just concentrate on the terrain under our feet. But if you look very carefully in that picture, there are lots of places where contours are missing. So it's steep ground. Thinking that the weather was really bad, it's, it's quite wet. You know, so maybe that steep ground could be rocky and slippy. So therefore it's going to be slower and more challenging. We'll have to be kind of more engaged into the environment that we're in. And there's also water hazards because it was raining. We had to think, well, the streams there, are those streams going to actually get quite full? And are they going to be crossable? Can we actually negotiate them with the amount of rain that's been happening throughout the day? And that's just something else that's another associated hazard with being out in the mountains is that we need to think about <laughs> river crossings and, and, and water problems. You know, on a day like this, this river here, it's quite wide, but it's very shallow, it's very dry, and it's very manageable to actually get across. But with the matter, within the matter of hours or a few days before you plan on going out, the lag time of rain, or depending on where you are, the rivers can fill up pretty quickly and pretty fast and be almost impassable. You know, so you have to think about going further upstream or to somewhere where it's straighter and, and calm to try and negotiate getting across. <clears throat> Other times it can just be completely uh, uncrossable. So it's just bearing that in mind in the journeys that you do. Lucky enough where we were that day that the rivers weren't that bad. So maybe the better decision to make on my part in actually uh, getting off Ben Jerig the best route might have been just to go back the way we came. The reason being that we have done that route, we actually know the history of what it was like, um, and it was a safer route off, there was less water hazards. Even though it was unpleasant to get up that way, it was the best way to get back down, you know, trudging through all that heather. At least it wasn't a steep grind. And like I said, we, we know what we've just come up. So if, you know, looking back in the decisions that we made or I made that day, going back the way they came was, was the better option rather than me just thinking, let's get off the hill, let's follow this river down and put ourselves into potentially steep or hazardous grind, you know. So you can see there, that's kind of, the, the gully that we've come out of, you know, coming back down through that grind and looking back, it actually was quite steep. It's quite rocky coming down through there. Um, and this is kind of where that photograph was taken, feeling quite relieved that we'd actually managed to get ourselves out of that kind of steep grind behind us. And at this stage in the day, this is about four o'clock. So this is quite late on in the day. And I think actually we're close to actually have running out of food. So that was another fall. Um, pitfall that we'd uh, put ourselves into was the lack of food that we'd taken for that day as well. And you can see, you know, at four o'clock, the forecast had suggested that maybe it was to clear up and to improve throughout the day. But you can clearly see by that photograph that it hadn't. We're still quite wet, quite damp, um, and just wanting to be off the hill at this stage. So finally, 
you know, even the dog was that tired. It was a long day. So at this stage, it was seven o'clock in the evening. You can see actually in that photograph, the weather's improved. Their waterproof jackets have actually dried out. So that forecast uh, didn't improve throughout the day until quite late on in the evening. So that was one thing that kind of caught us off guard as well was the, uh, the suggestion of an improving forecast throughout the day. But just to do one Monroe, that took us, I think it was somewhere between, I think it was close to 10 hours just to go, ahead and go out there and back. We had intended to do three within that time. So we totally underestimated, or I totally underestimated, underestimated the terrain in that environment. And that all boiled down to the fact that it was poor planning on my part that I didn't spend enough time, you know, the night before, looking at maybe what the better alternative within the Walk Highlands um, website may have suggested in terms of approaching Ben Jerry from an alternative route. I just looked at the map and thought, there's the road, there's Ben Jerry, that's the way that I want to go. And we got there, but it wasn't the best route for the day. Um, I think, you know, if we were to change any one of those decisions I made along the way, the outcome, the outcome could have been different. So I may have jumped the gun with the next um, slide there. So <clears throat> next little quiz for you. We're just kind of moving on, just a few other kind of things now to think about whilst right on the hills. So the quiz question going to come up shortly. Let's see how your Latin is. <clears throat> Okay, so if you had said the tick, then you'd have been right. So give yourself a pat on the back. So yeah, that is the Latin for our little beastie, the tick. So, you know, just if you've got, had any experience with ticks and them latching onto you, or if anybody's unfortunately like myself has, has had Lyme's disease in the past, um, it's a very unpleasant thing. And something to be very mindful about whenever you're out in the hills this summer. Um, and they, not all ticks carry Lyme's disease. It depends on the, uh, the host that's had a, a blood meal from previous. And they can be absolutely minuscule. So on this person's finger, the smallest one on the left-hand side is the little nymph. It's kind of its little first phase that it goes through and then it kind of every phase, you know, it has to have a blood meal and it gets bigger and bigger until you see the fully grown female uh, deer tick on the right hand side. Um, so I just kind of want to encourage folk that if you're out this summer, you know, if you're out kind of through long grass or anything like that, do pay attention to um, yourself and at the, throughout the day and the end of the day, just watch for any little kind of creepy crawlies um, around you. And it might be handy to actually think about buying some sort of suitable tick twister or tick remover. Um, so just kind of I want to highlight that point that, you know, they're prevalent and they are horrible little beasties. And um, yeah, just look after yourself when you're out there. And just to kind of show, um, hope uh, hope nobody's too squeamish, but just to show you kind of the after effects of a tick having uh, had its kind of uh, blood meal from someone that 
a couple of days later, you might get some sort of little rash. The common thing is like this kind of bullseye rash, the picture in the middle, but it's not always like that. It can be a blotch, you know. So if you're if you're ever in doubt, you know, um, get it checked out. That's the best thing. Yeah, so it's not always that typical bullseye rash that they mention of. <clears throat> so the other thing as well to highlight, folks, um, is that we've got really nice weather recently, and I hope that it continues through this summer for us all. Um, and I think it's really important that we think about looking after ourselves. Sun cream, sunblock, you know, it can be easily overlooked. Um, so yeah, again, just want to encourage folk to, to think about that. And there's a great campaign that's been recently going around um, and it's sun guarding sports, just raising awareness for looking after yourself or looking after um, yourself for outdoor, doing outdoor activities. Um, so yeah, it's worth checking this uh, out just to kind of spread the news, spread the word about looking after yourself in, in the outdoors, regardless of whatever sport you do. And just kind of coming back kind of full circle now to this idea of the adventure aware and using the Be Avalanche Aware process for, for planning a day out in the mountains, thinking about the journey that you do and thinking about those decisions that you make along the way um, on your day out. And that can be the decisions you make if you're by yourself or in a group, you know, and hopefully um, this little chat this evening that you've seen from my adventure with my wife out in the hills about the decisions that I made along the day, even though they weren't dangerous decisions, they weren't potentially the safest decisions. You know, if I had gone back and changed any one of those decisions, the outcome might have been different and we might have had a, a better day out in that weather. Um, but, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing, but we're here to reflect on that and learn and develop and move forwards in a positive way with that experience that we had but just to kind of highlight that point again that to have those successful days out it's about making consistently good decisions and that starts at the planning stage at home and just constantly thinking about how the day is going Because I think we as humans, we can easily be tricked and fooled into thinking that the decisions that are being made or the decisions we are making are the right ones. Or if somebody else makes a decision, you know, we, we naturally can, you know, think that, oh, yeah, that's the right decision. So I just want to kind of just, again, highlight that point that, you know, if a decision is being made or you're planning, think twice. Just, you know, don't get lured into that decision being the right one at that moment, you know, like a good carpenter would do, would be measured twice and cut once and just think about, you know, what what if, what are the consequences of me making this decision? Is there a better option in this moment in time? So again, hopefully not to detract or take away from the adventure and the fun of a day, but to make the day safer, it's just thinking differently and just thinking about the decisions that you need to make. So thinking about, well, where do you go from here? You know, if you want to get more information, knowledge, or kind of just to help, you know, develop your skill set or just have a, a little bit of fun over the next few weeks when you're at home, you can join on to our Sofa to Summit uh, campaign. And it's totally free to sign up for. Uh, and it's a online resource that is just filled with loads of questions, quizzes, little bits of um, knowledge and we videos and just kind of good bits of information to help you go from having no skills from ever being on the mountains to going, well, how do I go about getting into the mountains? Or just as a really kind of fun way to refresh the skills that you actually have as well. So worth checking out. And if you're interested in kind of coming along to a course to develop again your skills, or if you're feeling a bit rusty, you know, we have a wide range of, of skills. <clears throat> Um, courses that you can sign up for um, and being a member of Mountaineer in Scotland allows you to access those courses at a really kind of low cost price um, and you know by supporting Mountaineer in Scotland you're supporting a whole range of other 
uh, things that we do as an organization as well. So something to think about if you're interested. And with that, folks, I would just like to say thank you very much for coming along this evening. And I hope uh, listening to the story has been informative and you know you've take, you can take away something from it uh, and learn a little bit or just think differently about you know how you plan your day in the mountains um, so if you want to spend a little bit of time asking any questions in the chat room I'll do my best to answer as many as I can so <clears throat> one question here was what key piece of kit do you now take when out in the hills um, I think I think for me it's not just one um, I, I would take several key pieces of kit with me, and those would be a, a group shelter, um, and that can range from a two to four eight man group shelter. It's kind of basically like a, a lightweight version of the outside of a sleeping, but uh, outside of a tent, and it's very very useful for for any occasion, for an emergency, or if it's just a windy day, or be a wee bit wet and you're cold, and you just want to get out of the elements. You can then just hop into this kind of little shelter um, and yeah that sits in the bottom of my rucksack whenever I'm out in the hills and along with that would be a bivy bag one of those heavy duty orange bivy bags that cost about six pounds from any outdoor shop um, they're great for the winter for sliding down the hill if you want to get down quickly but you know in an emergency uh, getting out of the elements and getting out of the wind <clears throat> six quid can save your life you know so that's another piece of uh, kit that always sits in the bottom of a bag and a warm spare synthetic layer in a dry bag because uh, i don't want it getting wet because it's going to be a spare warm emergency layer so they're kind of the some of the, the three things that are probably take a bag all the time whenever i'm out in the hills oh interesting question which munro has been my favorite so far oh that's a good question I think, well, I don't really know. It's it's a hard one to choose. So it is, I I think, can I say the Cullen Ridge? I mean, there's I mean there's eleven Munros on that, but just the fact that those Munros on the Cullen Ridge, there's nothing else like it in Scotland, and it's like being in the Alps. You know, they're just spectacular Munros. Uh, somebody's asked, what wind is considered too dangerous? Um. I think you know whenever you're looking at a forecast and you're looking at kind of wind speeds and whether or not it's appropriate to go out on that wind speed. Um, again, that can come down to your risk tolerance and what you're comfortable being out in. But saying that, going out for a day walking in wind speeds that are 60 miles an hour, you know, in your face all day, and you're like, do I really want to do that? Probably not. Where maybe you know, with 30 mile an hour wind with maybe up to 40, you think, I feel like I, I could manage that okay. But again, the caveat to that is, do I want to be on a narrow ridge like the Anakiga with a 30 to 40 mile an hour wind? Or would I rather be somewhere in the Cairngorms where there are broad rolling hills that's kind of low risk, uh, that's with a manageable speed of 30 to 40 miles an hour. But again, 30 to 40 miles an hour wind speed can be very different for me, who's five foot 10, in comparison to my wife, who's only five foot and quite small, you know, so the wind speed is going to have a different effect on the both of us. So it's certainly um, worth considering all those factors about what you think is dangerous or appropriate for you and the environment that you're going into. And that will come down to the time spent in the planning of a day in the mountains, looking at the forecast, looking at the hill that you want to go do, and just putting that all together. <clears throat> Somebody's asked, uh, what's uh, my opinion on GPS trackers? Like, for example, the spot device or you know, a GPS tracker. Um, if I'm going out somewhere really remote or I'm going out for an expedition, I would take a, a spot tracker or a personal locator beacon with me. Uh, to have, you know, because it might be that I go somewhere where the phone has got absolutely no signal whatsoever, or my, I could break my phone, my phone could, battery could die in an emergency, and still got that lifeline to the outside world as well. So if I'm going, I, you know, I, I would take one. You know, they're quite lightweight and the, the, um, the battery lasts a long time, and you can keep it switched off and use it only when you need to. So 
yeah, I would I would take one. Mm -hmm. Somebody's asked um, really useful things for a first aid kit. First aid kit, you know, what's really useful? Lots of triangular bandages to give support to something that's broken or out of place. Um, and then duct tape. Um, I think you can get sports wrap, things that stick to themselves. Um, maybe some paracetamol, things like that, but you need to be careful about if someone has um, any allergies to those types of things as well. Um, what else would be useful? Not, yeah, kind of um, absorbent dressings as well, just in case somebody does have that wee spill where they take a wee knock to the head or there is a little bit of blood. Um, but just a lot of triangular bandages, again, just to help support things as well. Because anything else, I think for me personally, if it's uh, serious, then it's going to be a mountain rescue call where I need help. Where if I have someone who is still able bodied and, and can walk, I can maybe give assistance to someone so they're kind of walking wounded. Um, but yeah, it's just a good quality first aid kit with lots of triangular bandages, is always good. Somebody's asked about what three words. Um, <clears throat> It's one of these things that keeps cropping up um, with kind of mountain rescue um, teams and wanting to use it. Um, it. It works, but you know, OS locate or a six figure grid reference would be the better option because it's a quicker, easier thing to use. But what three words in your settings, you can change some of the things to give you that grid reference as well. But I think the problem with what three words is that that's exactly it, what three words. Those three words could easily be miscommunicated over a phone call, or if you have in a text message, you might misspell something because it's crucial to get the right word for the location because one change in the letter or a word can take you to somewhere completely different. Where a grid reference is based on numbers, apart from zero and seven, numbers are all single syllable and they're easier to portray across in a, in a voice message or over a phone call where words can be you know, misinterpreted. Um, but if that's the only thing that you've got to give somebody your location, then Mountain Rescue will make it work but there are better alternatives for being out in the mountains, such as OS Locate. So folks, I think we'll, uh, we'll, we'll call it there. So I'd just like to say thank you again for, for joining me this evening. And I hope, I hope the talk's been um, informative, uh, entertaining. And you know, if you've taken away one piece of information from it, then that's great. You know? So uh, thanks very much for joining us. And, I hope you enjoy the rest of your week and whatever you do, whatever you're out in the hills next, uh, just have a really great time, enjoy them and stay safe. Um, so yeah, thank you very much folks and uh, all the best. <laughs>